uh, and Eltok, uh, chapter five is about to get underway. And our first speaker, the person kicking us off, no pressure there then, Nathan, uh, it's kicking off 24 hours of chapter five, uh, is uh, Nathan Thomas. I'm going to ask Nathan to come on the screen. There he is. Hi, Nathan. And let's get his slides uh, up and running. And as I do that, let me uh, say to you that Nathan Thomas is a lecturer in TESOL at the Institute of Education, uh, which is a great place because I studied there. Uh, UCL's Faculty of Education and Society at the University College in London and a teaching fellow in Applied Linguistics at the University of Oxford. He is mainly interested in how students with language-related challenges learn strategically at all levels of second and foreign language education. And prior to this, his current roles uh, were he taught English for academic purposes in the UK and spent 10 years teaching in China and Thailand. Uh, so that's given him a good background to talk to us today about self-regulated learning. So Nathan, Let's get Altoc underway. Over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Sean. <clears throat> it's uh, great to see so many people here. I'm uh, very excited to be a part of this event. And I have to uh, thank Sean and the other organizers again for uh, putting together an event that is so organized. Um, I've been very impressed by this whole process. Uh, so, so thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, presenting on a topic uh, that I'm passionate about, which is self-regulated learning. Um, you can see that this presentation is titled Part 1. Um, there is another presentation later on in the event that I will uh, signpost you to later, which is Part 2. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the organizational side of self-regulated learning, which is a side that is often forgotten. Uh, we we often think about self-regulated learning as something that learners do uh, independently or autonomously on their own. Um, however, self-regulated learning tends to be most successful when it is supported by organizations and the institutions that uh, students are a part of. So I'm mainly talking about formal education settings such as universities, schools, uh, language centers, uh, these kinds of settings. And I'm mainly speaking on uh, initially what self-regulated learning is, uh, and then how organizations can support teachers and students uh, in order to uh, be successful in their self-regulated learning endeavors. Um, in part two of this talk, which happens, uh, I believe, later today or tomorrow, uh, there will be uh, that session will focus mostly on what teachers can do and also look at students themselves uh, doing self-regulated learning. So the idea is that uh, by watching both of these parts, you can have a pretty comprehensive view of uh, supporting self-regulated learning for, for language learners at all levels. All right, so just to get us started, I think it's important to talk a little bit about terminology. Um, go full screen, okay. Um, to talk a little bit about terminology. Um, so first of all, self-regulation is a, a concept that was initially uh, developed in the field of psychology and psychologists were interested in how individuals monitored and controlled uh, their own behavior in the pursuit of their goals. Now this, we have of course adapted this same definition to talk about uh, language learning and specifically for this event, uh, English language learning and teaching. Uh, but self-regulation is popular in, in all uh, endeavors that are relevant to um, the study of psychology. So for example, how um, maybe athletes regulate their emotions uh, before and during a big event. Um, it could be um, uh, potentially how people in uh, any sort of high pressure work or business situation deal with that pressure and are able to, to regulate themselves, to control or to manage themselves and their emotions as well as their behavior in route to some sort of end goal. So the goal is very important uh, to emphasize in this process. Um, and when we talk about self-regulated learning, uh, we talk about learning goals. So for, for us uh, as language teachers, uh, of course, this can be um, a number of different goals depending on the level of students that you're working with um, and what their uh, aims are in general, as well as uh, thinking about how we can support them to achieve those aims while at the same time giving them the tools they need to be able to hopefully be successful doing this uh, on their own at some point. 
Um, so a big part of this presentation is about supporting self-regulated learning, not necessarily uh, assuming that all learners can do it immediately. I think there's a, a, a big emphasis in this talk um, about looking at how teachers can be supportive of students in their self-regulated learning endeavors. Um, just to take a look at the picture on the right of the screen, uh, we can see there's someone uh, that appears to be sleeping and we can see that there is an alarm clock. It looks like about four minutes past noon. Uh, we may assume that this is someone who is not necessarily being very successful with their self-regulation endeavors. Maybe they're, they've overslept. Maybe they've missed a class that they were supposed to take in the morning uh, because they didn't plan properly or because they uh, missed their alarm. Um, so um, this, is, this is an example of sort of self-regulation gone awry, basically. Um, we can also look at this in a slightly different way. Maybe this person has stayed up late because they were studying and they uh, made a decision to turn off their alarm or to hit snooze a couple extra times in order to be more rested for the learning that's going to take place in the afternoon. Um, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that self-regulated learning or self-regulation in general is complex and that we have different goals and we have different ways of going about achieving those goals. And that it's really uh, what we try to do as educators is to try to understand the process behind it uh, and to try to understand what these goals are and what needs to be planned, monitored, uh, assessed and reflected on uh, in order to achieve these goals. So for the learner in this picture, uh, we're unsure of what their uh, goals are. They may or may not be on track, depending on uh, depending on uh, the, you know the purpose of them sleeping at this time, for example. Uh, but this is just one one way of sort of understanding what self regulation is in general. It's about planning, monitoring, assessing, and reflecting on one's own own uh, behavior and how that behavior is is uh, controlled in the pursuit of of one's goals. Okay, so moving forward, um, I like to emphasize as well that successful self-regulated learning is an educational ideal. And I say ideal because I believe it's something that um, we should be striving for and hoping for with our learners uh, as, as educators. We want them to be successfully self-regulated, um, but we can't assume that all learners are able to do this without having support uh, from others, whether it's a, a, a teacher or parents or you know, at the organizational level as well, an organization that supports and facilitates this kind of learning. So I believe it's an ideal that we should be striving for. Um, uh, one, one way to think about it, um, and when this kind of relates to the picture on the previous slide, is that it's very easy to be self-regulated, right? The, the learner in the picture can choose not to get out of bed in the morning. They can choose to skip their class, to um, not read or to not study uh, vocabulary that they had planned to study. Uh, it's very easy to make those decisions. Um, so I would, I would argue that it's very easy to be self-regulated, but to be successfully self-regulated, to be able to, to monitor and control your behavior, uh, especially as uh, for, for young and novice learners, uh, can be very difficult. Uh, so this is why I'm referring to it as an ideal. And I want to draw your attention to uh, related terms that you may have come across. For example, we have self-directed learning, which has very similar uh, aims in terms of how it relates to self-regulated learning. It just comes from a slightly different um, theoretical and conceptual background, but the underlying idea is, is re relatively the same, at least for the purpose of us as educators. Uh, we're not going to get into a debate here about different terminology, I hope. Um, we also have a second term here, which is learner autonomy. Again, uh, similar underlying aims uh, coming from a different place. So self-regulation and self-regulated learning sort of stemmed or arose from uh, educational uh, psychologists, uh, mainly in the US, but also in other places as well. We even go back to uh, as far back as looking at um, uh, Vygotsky, for example, who talked about object regulation, other regulation, and eventually self-regulation of learning. So it has, its, it has its origins in slightly different places, whereas learner autonomy really originated in Europe. So we're kind of seeing the development of different ideas uh, with the same underlying messages, but coming from, from different places. 
And for me, uh, what this signals to is that regardless of the terminology, if the underlying uh, message is the same or, or relatively similar, then we must be on to something worthwhile. <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't be popping up in these different parts of the world. So um, to draw your attention to a third term, uh, which is learner agency, this is essentially uh, a learner's capacity uh, to, to make decisions uh, agentively about their own learning. Uh, so again, slightly different concept, but still the same underlying message. What I want to, to emphasize here is that regardless of the term that you're most familiar with, um, what all of these terms have in common is the focus on learner action. It's about learners being active in their own learning processes as opposed to being passive and waiting for someone else to tell them what to do or to, to show up to class and to, to only uh, wait for the teacher to provide them with, <clears throat> sorry, with, uh, with, with uh, an appropriate uh, method or technique or strategy. So the focus is on really what learners can bring to the learning process and the responsibility that they have for taking control of, monitoring, um, and basically reflecting on their own learning in their pursuit of their goals. This is sort of the priority over what we would see, you know, several decades ago, which was a, a, a very much a focus on methods. There was a lot of discussion about what's the best way to teach learners. And, uh, you know, if we, I'm, I'm sure all of us here who have gone through uh, teacher training certificates and courses like this, we were introduced to, you know, the audiolingual method and eventually to communicative language teaching and all of these, these different ways of, of doing teaching and, and doing learning in a classroom. Um, what self-regulated learning does in these other terms is the removes that focus from the methods of the teacher and looks more at what learners do themselves. Okay, so I'm going to pause um, just for a moment here because I would like to get uh, some feedback uh, from you before I move further. Um, so if you can just take a look at this question on the screen, uh, why is self-regulated learning important? Um, and if you could put an answer in the chat, I would love to, to hear uh, from our audience members and I will just open the chat for a moment so I can see. There's no right or wrong answer here. Uh, it would be great to just have a few responses. Uh, well, I'm sure we'll get more than a few because we have a very big audience, but to get some responses to see about uh, how, how, how you would answer this question. So why is, why is self-regulated learning important or is it important? I'm, I'm not sure, you may have a different opinion. Okay, I can see lots of responses coming in, lots of links to motivation. Yeah, some quotes there. You can lead a, hoarder, a horse to uh, water, but you can't make it drink, that kind of idea. Sure. Um, no one's there to guide you. Voluntary learning, effectiveness, discipline, confidence, motivation, all these key words. The chat is moving so quickly, but I'm just picking up on different words here. Um, lots of key terms to consider. Need students' interests to empower the learner. Yeah. Okay, this is great. This is great. Um, I really appreciate you all uh, uh, adding these responses. It, it's, it's, it's just wonderful to see how many people we have and how many different ideas are coming in. Um, again, different keywords now popping up, learning at one's own pace, curiosity for one's betterment. Uh, someone mentioned that time has changed. Okay, that's interesting. A kind of, uh, sort of <laughs> macro way of looking at this, times have changed, we need to change as well, something like that. Uh, discipline, growth. Okay, this is great. Um, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to uh, minimize the chat for a second because I won't be able to focus on my talk if I keep it open. Um, but yeah, lots of keywords there. Um, and it's great to see different perspectives, but again, looking at where the overlaps are there and where sort of commonalities are, or themes that are coming out of the chat there. We have things like motivation, uh, which is a very important one. And a few people even mentioned intrinsic motivation, which is something that I'll speak about um, in, in a few slides. But for me, uh, when trying to put some brief bullet points together, I focused on um, three ideas, mainly looking at 
uh, again, this focus on formal education settings, schools, universities, language centers, these kinds of settings. And I think uh, one thing that we uh, probably can all agree on, or at least most of us, is that we have limited contact hours. And as Sean was mentioning when he was talking about the, the um, when you find the words campaign, uh, language learning is difficult and it takes a long time. Um, there's, there's no quick fix or magic pill that you can take in order to, um, in order to develop language. No. Now, now, maybe in the near future, we can download languages into our, into our heads at some point. Maybe that's coming sooner rather than later. Uh, but until then, uh, language learning takes, takes time and we have limited contact hours as teachers. Um, you know, I, I remember when I first started teaching, I, I saw uh, various classes uh, for 50 minutes a week, and that was it. They had 50 minutes of English language instruction in one week, and we were expected to, to get results from that. You know, I can imagine there's lots of people here in, in similar situations where the contact hours are very limited, and yet we're still responsible, um, and we want our learners to, to, to make progress. Um, I would say um, you may, you'd be lucky to see your learners three times a week. Um, you know, if you're in a situation where you see them most days or every day, then that's that's really wonderful. But even then, if seeing learners for an hour a day, um, there's still a lot of time that needs to be made up elsewhere in terms of reading, um, self-study of vocabulary, you know, things like extensive listening to get that input, uh, practicing conversations with others. There's lots of things that happen outside of the classroom or, or that need to happen outside of the classroom uh, in order for uh, language learning to be successful, in order to, to make progress that is noticeable. And when we talk about something like motivation, a lot of times making progress sort of creates a feedback loop where learners can see their proficiency increasing. Maybe they're able to understand that uh, podcast that they weren't able to understand previously or they were able to express themselves well when speaking with someone in English. And that feedback loop sort of motivates them and encourages them to seek out more of those activities. Um, could also be that intrinsic motivation where they are just really passionate and interested in the language and they want to um, see themselves progress. Now that's not always the case. It's not always, um, uh, the case that we have these sort of ideal learners where they are very intrinsically motivated and they love English and they they want to improve. Sometimes we have learner. Well, unfortunately, most of the time we have um, lots of learners in our classrooms who are just there because they have to be or because they need to pass a test or their parents have enrolled them in a language center on Saturday mornings and they wish they were somewhere else. You know, we. This links to the second bullet point, which is the idea that we have diverse learners. So beyond just having limited contact hours, but we have diverse learners, learners with various needs. And by sort of teaching them how to learn, as opposed to just teaching them explicitly or teaching them what to learn, um, we enable them to pursue their goals in ways that, that suit them. This sort of a more personalized approach by teaching uh, a range of, of self-regulated learning uh, skills and strategies. Um, we're able to enable them to pursue these goals in a way that a teacher who's managing an entire classroom is unable to, to do themselves. You know, of course, in an ideal situation, um, if you're a language learner, you have a teacher on hand at all times. They're always willing to sit down with you to answer your questions, to provide instruction. Uh, but that's just, that's just not the case. So we have limited contact hours, diverse learners, and also policy recommendations now. This is um, this may be uh, surprising because I don't think I saw anyone in the chat mention policy. If you did, I'm sorry, um, the chat was moving very quickly, but policy recommendations now for self-regulated learning or things like, uh, you may hear it you know, described using different terms, as I, as I mentioned before, such as self-regulated, or sorry, self-directed learning, uh, le uh, autonomous learning, independent learning. Um, but these terms have been creeping their way into policy documents, both in sort of local, regional and national levels uh, in looking at different areas of education. I know when I started my teaching career and I was working in Thailand, um, there, there was uh, lots of discussion about learner autonomy and sort of fostering 
uh, this ability to be able to be autonomous and independent in one's learning endeavors. Um, uh, very similar uh, if we look at other contexts like Japan, where I believe the term is independent learning is, is, is being used more commonly. So it's the idea that um, we have these very practical concerns as teachers, um, but also because this, rec this, because this presentation, self-regulated learning part one, is focusing on the organizational level, we also have to consider policy recommendations and potentially leverage those policy recommendations uh, to enable us to to make change in our classrooms by, uh, you know, interacting with management or if you're a head of department, you may be interested in uh, looking at what the policies say and seeing if that can sort of provide you a justification for carving out, um, you know, part of a lesson to teach uh, a learning strategy, for example, or sort of using that as as leverage to uh, invite speakers to come in and to provide professional development workshops where uh, where there is going to be this sort of training on how to actually do it. So it's the idea that in these formal education settings, there are lots of reasons why we may want to, to do self-regulated learning or to try to implement it. Uh, and these are just three reasons, but I think it boils down to uh, sort of the main idea here is that students benefit uh, from learning how to learn, as I mentioned before, not just being instructed on what to do. Um, so it's the idea that we can provide some general strategies, which uh, in part two of this presentation, uh, higher renders will be uh, sharing, sort of looking at the teacher and student level. Um, and then uh, what I'll be focusing on for most of the rest of this presentation after the next slide or two, we'll be looking at how organizations can support this and trying to understand self-regulated learning, not from the perspective of the individual independent uh, learner who's sort of isolated in their own mind, basically, but trying to understand self-regulated learning from a complex sort of systems perspective, looking at the interactions at different levels of this system, from learners to their peers, to teachers, parents, et cetera, sort of moving our way up. So in, in mentioning these things, I think it's important to also uh, sort of take care or address the elephant in the room, as we would say here. And this is the idea of thinking of, oh, okay, well, maybe this is just something that advanced learners can do or, um, you know, from, from adults, uh, basically. Uh, but I think it's, it's important to mention, and there, there are lots of studies that have looked at self-regulation in children. And this, was, of course, was very popular in uh, Vygotsky's social psychology uh, work and his sociocultural theory, where he looked at how children uh, develop self-regulation skills, moving from object and other regulation through to co-regulation, uh, maybe some form of shared regulation, and eventually maybe arriving at uh, a self self-regulation, being able to do that successfully. So even children who are very young and novices can be taught uh, strategies and skills and sort of have their ability to regulate their own learning uh, fostered by teachers who encourage them, uh, who monitor their self-regulated uh, learning behavior uh, and also uh, serve as models for this kind of behavior. We can see in the picture on the right of the slide, we have a teacher here who is you know, seated at the same level as young learners, not standing above them, not at the front of the classroom, but in a situation where she's you know, at the same level as learners. They're doing some sort of activity where they're somewhat in control. There's this negotiation of autonomy and negotiation of regulation taking place, but the learner is there to support and potentially co-regulating this learning by allowing the students to, to take a little bit of control of the lesson, to feel like, to feel like they have that uh, capacity and that it's being supported by the teacher, uh, but yet the teacher is, is still there providing support if they need it and at the same time, monitoring to ensure that they're staying on track um, and rewarding strategic decisions. Um, it's the idea that at all levels, we can do small things to sort of uh, plant these seeds into learners' uh, into minds and to get them thinking about uh, ways that they can, they can monitor their own learning uh, eventually. So as we said, uh, what I'd like to signal to is this um, continuum model uh, that, I, that I developed that sort of maps out uh, strategic uh, learning and sort of regulation of learning on a continuum. And I think that this is um, this can be very helpful. Uh, I realize it's 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 a bit 
it's, it's a bit academic for some. It's based on uh, a theory of motivation called self-determination theory that uh, Heath Rose and I have adapted to sort of display different levels of, of strategy use, regulatory styles, and sources of strategic behavior. Uh, but without going into the, the nitty gritty of all of the details, um, we can see that on the left side of the continuum, we have someone who is, you know, non-strategic. There's no real regulation. Their strategic behavior is, is, is non-existent. They're not doing things strategically to ensure that learning is taking place. You know, unfortunately, uh, if we're working in, in uh, schools and universities, we will encounter uh, students like this. So it's the idea that maybe with some sort of support, the scaffolding from teachers, that we can move this along this continuum, move them along this continuum towards the right. And you can see we have different forms of regulation being introduced. So just one step to the right, we have this sort of other regulated strategy user where their style of regulation is mostly external. Maybe it's mostly coming from a teacher or a parent or peers. Um, However, they're still active and strategic. They are uh, still doing things to enhance uh, their own learning, but this is being regulated or managed by someone else. Now, if we move over to the right, which is where you know, we want to see our learners moving to these more uh, sort of somewhat external, somewhat internal, and finally this internal source of strategic behavior and regulation that has somehow been you know, integrated into the learner's own practices and and their own identity in terms of who they are as a learner. You know, there's someone who sees themselves as having uh, control and being able to regulate their own learning. Now, at the extreme right side of the continuum, we have this uh, intrinsically sort of self-regulated uh, strategy user. And to me, this is uh, a, a very extreme ideal, just like the extreme of on the other side of the, the learner who's who's not strategic at all, uh, this right side is also an extreme. So I want, to, um, I want to bring this to your attention as well, because as teachers, we often get these ideas promoted to us and, and uh, they don't sit well with us. This is, how, this is how I felt when I first learned about uh, learning strategies and self-regulation. I was reading these studies and I thought, this just doesn't represent the learners that I work with. I have some very successful learners, but I couldn't think of more than two or three maybe that I would consider self-regulated and maybe just one or two that were intrinsically self-regulated, meaning that they're learning the language and they're making decisions about their learning out of enjoyment because they like it, not for some external reward. Um, so this is where the idea for this continuum came from. And I think um, sort of the main takeaway from it is that when talking about self-regulation, I think we have to view it as an ideal where we want someone to move towards these this right side of the continuum. But if they're successful in their learning endeavors and they're achieving the goals that they need to achieve or that they want to achieve, and they're ending up somewhere in the middle of this continuum, then that's okay. You know, we don't need we don't need everyone to be to be pushed to or to you know the sort of paradox of trying to to force learners to love English or something like that, uh, to to be strategic. So uh, this is something I wanted to draw your attention to because initially I was quite uh, critical of, of work in this area. And I, I published several papers on this topic, more academic type papers. And it was working on uh, the position paper uh, for the project that I'm sharing today that my ideas sort of changed a bit. And we were able to <clears throat> talk about constraints and limitations of self-regulated learning while also looking at solutions and ways to uh, implement self-regulated learning uh, within these constraints. So speaking of constraints, it's a nice transition to this, uh, my second discussion question. So if you uh, see this, uh, you can respond in the chat just as you did uh, to, the, to the first question. And that's uh, why is self-regulated learning difficult to implement in formal education settings? So I've, we've talked about the benefits, I've made it sound you know, so nice, so great. Uh, I've also talked a little bit about my own skepticism when self-regulated isn't, uh, you know, supported as well as it should be or, or could be. Um, but in your opinion, why is self-regulated learning difficult to implement? Before I share my ideas, it'd be great to hear some of yours. Okay, admin issues, time consuming, 
difficult to assess, policy, mess up the structure of the lesson, not enough time. Yeah, time is a big one. Strict curriculum. Students have too much to learn. That's an interesting one, saying students have too much to learn. It's, um, you know, one of the, one of the, the main takeaways uh, about self-regulated learning is that we do have limited time with our students, and so they need strategies to be able to learn on their own. Um, so yes, they have a lot to learn, um, but I think part of this is trying to in encourage them to, to take on some of that responsibility and not feeling like as teachers that we have to sort of get that knowledge into them, basically. Um, okay, things about, comments about the curriculum, institution can't look at individuals' needs, exam oriented, yes. Yeah, you are um, <laughs> you are speaking to uh, uh, someone who is very much having these same concerns. As I said before, before I asked this question, I was very skeptical of, of self-regulated learning before I started working on this position paper. Um, and as I said, it seems like an ideal that was very hard to reach. Um, a lack of confidence considered out of the box. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna minimize the chat again, just again, because there's just so many messages coming in. And if I read them all, I, I would never finish. Um, so <clears throat> again, um, I'm right there with you with these concerns. And uh, as Sean mentioned, um, so at the start of the presentation, my own background is uh, you know, uh, English language teaching, teaching EFL, uh, basically in, in Thailand and then China. Uh, and then the UK, where I was teaching academic English. Now I do uh, teacher training, uh, working with pre-service teachers and also in-service teachers. So I still I feel like I've seen sort of various aspects of this in different settings. Um, so according, uh, well, not according to me, but from my perspective um, and from the perspective that we we put forward in the uh, in the uh, position paper that I'll be sharing uh, and that this presentation is based on. Um, some of the main challenges have to do with fundamental issues. Uh, for example, differences in the way self-regulated learning is understood, uh, taught, and supported. It's the idea that um, if a teacher wants to, to try some kind of innovative practice, and if self-regulated learning is seen as innovative, even though, as I mentioned before, policy documents have been calling for this for years, um, if, if that teacher is seen as doing something very different, or if it's something that doesn't align with what uh, someone at a higher level recommends, you know, head of department or uh, principals, that sort of that sort of position, uh, then it can lead to roadblocks. And, and there were comments in the curricula or comments in the chat about um, curricula not being able to uh, align with the aims of self-regulated learning. And this is something that we're very aware of when we talk about sort of the constraints uh, in implementing it. Um, I think it starts from understanding what it is not viewing self-regulated learning as just something that students do um, without the support of a teacher, but looking at the teacher's role as being someone who is still very much involved, uh, who still has the explicit role of teaching language. I'm not saying that teachers are removed from the context completely. One of my biggest arguments academically and in my scholarly career has been, what about the teacher? What about the teacher's role? If we're talking about things like learner autonomy and self-regulation, uh, what what does the teacher do and how is the teacher affected? So I think that we start by having having an understanding of it as being a supportive sort of scaffolded process that organizations need to support at a, at a higher sort of macro level, working down to teachers supporting it in their own classrooms, and then even developing activities where learners can support each other. And this is something that we provide um, uh, ideas for uh, in this uh, position paper that I've uh, mentioned several times now. Um, so this is uh, basically four academics who were previous teachers and researchers, scholars with different opinions about self-regulated learning, different backgrounds. And we all came together uh, under the umbrella of, of an Oxford University Press position paper. And we had meetings to share our ideas about how self-regulated learning can actually be implemented in formal education settings. Uh, and we attempted to provide a comprehensive framework that uh, addresses not just what learners can do and, and what teachers can do, but also looking at those more macro organizational, institutional 
uh, and even briefly societal uh, sort of limitations and and possible affordances. So um, this paper is not out yet. It is finished. Uh, I think it's in process of being published. Uh, and we can share a link for you if you're uh, if you, if you're interested. You can be um, alerted when this paper is is published. Um, I'm sure uh, OUP will will, will uh, keep us updated and potentially put a link in the chat there if anyone's interested. Um, but what I want to uh, what I want to say as well is um, in the next few slides I'm focusing on the organization level and that's how I'll finish up the presentation by going through uh, three key ideas that organizations can consider. Uh, in, in high O renders, we'll be looking at teachers and learners in part two, which if you're in the UK, it looks like it's uh, in the middle of the night, uh, but these sessions are recorded. And so if you're unable to uh, stay up, uh, stay up in order to do that, uh, to attend the session, uh, then you can watch the recording later on. And high O will talk about the more practical things uh, teachers in their own classrooms can do to support uh, self-regulated learning. Um, so for me, uh, I'll be focusing on the top half of this framework. I realize um, it's it's a bit difficult to see everything. It's, it's hard to squeeze all of this onto one slide. Um, on the next slide, I'll be zooming in on the top half. So don't don't worry um, if you if it's if it's hard to see if you're on a phone um, or, or another device. But the main takeaway from this is that the framework visualizes how all parts of an organization can be involved in the implementation of self-regulated learning. It's the idea that from the from the very macro level of societal, um, you know, policies, regulations in terms of in terms of um, not self-regulation, obviously, but regulations in terms of uh, policy, uh, uh, national type issues, um, looking at things like uh, institutional level, the curriculum that institutions uh, implement or put forward, uh, as well as how students are evaluated. This is sort of the number one. Um, issue that comes up is what about test taking? What about our students? This is great. We want to promote self-regulated learning, but our students are evaluated on a standardized test. So what can we do? Um, what we try to do in this uh, in this framework and, and in the position paper is to provide some steps and provide a systematic approach where we can try to integrate these different levels and look at how these levels uh, can work together uh, so that activities at one level can relate to and support activities at another level. So a teacher who is working in their own classroom uh, to promote self-regulated learning can be supported by a head of department, by other teachers, and that we can see this implementation um, implemented as smoothly as possible. It will never be entirely smooth, but as smoothly as possible uh, when these different activities can align. On the bottom half of the model, which is what Hayo will be talking about in part two, uh, we can see sort of what learners do, and it gets all the way down to, to task regulations, so how learners self-regulate or potentially use different forms of regulation uh, to complete uh, different academic tasks. And my empirical research uh, recently has focused a lot on this level. So I'm quite interested in looking at how learners complete challenging academic tasks and different strategies and forms of regulation that they draw on uh, in order to do that. Uh, but again, Hayo will be talking uh, more about that in part two. Um, so for now, zooming in on the top half, which is the um, sort of broader issues, um, I think we can, we can come to an agreement that societal, organizational, and managerial forces affect pedagogy. I mean, there's no way around it. As we said before, they will have, institutions will have their own goals uh, and aims for what they, what they want to see, um, what the national policy requires them to do, uh, et cetera. These all have an effect on pedagogy. So when we're talking about uh, promoting self-regulated learning, we're not talking about revamping the whole curriculum and doing away with textbooks and tests entirely or anything like that. But I think our main recommendation is, is to, to carve out some time within uh, uh, lessons, some time within a syllabus and within a curriculum at a, at a higher level, you know, carve out a space uh, to teach strategies and skills that are necessary in order for learners to to take more control of their own learning with the support of teachers, because our job is very important. We're there to support. We're not there to just provide materials and to, to let students go on their own. Um, 
the idea here is that organizations that aim to implement self-regulated learning must engage in their own self-regulatory process, that sort of loop of, of planning, implementing, monitoring, assessing, reflecting, this kind of loop that, that uh, leads to improved practices. Uh, the responsibility is not just on students and teachers, but also the organizations themselves to make sure that students and teachers are being supported in these kind of aims. Um, and I, I feel like I'm shaking my finger a little bit at, at uh, certain, certain uh, people in certain positions in this presentation. I hope it doesn't seem like that, but it, it's just that this is an ideal. And when these kind of ideas are mentioned to teachers, um, teachers are often very skeptical because they know that their time is limited and they know that they have certain goals that they need to achieve themselves and sort of telling them that they need to carve out additional time to do and to support self-regulated learning can, can be very difficult. So I am talking to, uh, to slightly more senior uh, people or people in those kind of positions at the moment. So in the position paper, uh, we, we, we draw on uh, Mishra and Kohler's uh, sort of framework or sort of continuum line or line of development or trajectory uh, in looking at uh, these kind of processes from a pre-emerging stage where there's no action taking place, people are relatively unaware, um, all the way through to sort of empowering the kind of actions where we can see something like self-regulated learning happening in a, in a formal education setting and things are going well. Um, so it's uh, similar to that continuum of mind that I showed earlier, but there's this more like a, a, a one-way sort of arrow looking at uh, what we can do to move through each stage of this. And of course, in the position paper, we, we spend a bit more time breaking these ideas down. But what, what, uh, what we can see sort of immediately is if we look at something fairly basic, like starting with the idea of understanding needs and wants, uh, we can start looking at moving from this emerging stage to something that's more empowering by, as I mentioned earlier, examining national, local, and qualification specific policies and regulations that are in place. Uh, it's looking at uh, an acknowledgement of the constraints that we work within, uh, these systems that we are a part of, and then seeing what we can do within those systems to enable uh, this, this, these processes to occur. So we can find certain requirements, you know, if a, if a, if a document says that, or uh, certain recommendations, you know. Um, an example that sort of hits close to home for me as someone who teaches on master's degree uh, programs uh, here in the UK is the idea that when international students come to the UK, they're often shocked uh, in universities at how much autonomy they're expected to have. They're thrown into a situation where they don't have many contact hours. Uh, they're given long reading lists. They're given tasks and things to do on their own, but they don't have someone meeting with them every day to uh, to tell them exactly what to do and when to do it and to uh, provide that kind of formative assessment that would be so helpful for them. Um, they're expected to be uh, self-regulated, to be autonomous and to be quite independent in their own learning. And this can be a shock. Um, so I think at the organizational level, um, even universities can do a lot better job at um, sort of exploring sort of how learners can be supported in these kinds of settings, whether it be uh, setting up peer groups, uh, social groups where they can sort of help each other to, to plan and to regulate. Um, I know in recent research that I did, students were setting up Zoom calls where they wouldn't even speak to each other, but they would just turn on the camera and they would study together um, when we were still doing sort of distance education due to COVID. And this is co-regulation. This is, this is a learner who is, has acknowledged uh, that they're not necessarily as successful as they could be if they're doing self-regulated learning on their own, but they co-regulate their learning with someone else, with a peer who is present, albeit you know, visually or digitally, um, but that they're sort of using this to, to, to co-regulate their learning. And I think that um, that's a, a very simple strategy. Uh, maybe a lot of learners and teachers have already thought of that, or you've seen these initiatives where these kind of silent online working spaces have been introduced. Um, but I think in general, we can do a better job of looking at um, sort of encouraging and teaching strategies such as that, that may stem from these national, local or qualification specific uh, recommendations and requirements. You know, the example I used was basically the requirement to be 
more self-regulated or to be more autonomous when you come to the UK to do a master's degree, for example. You're provided guidance, but you have a lot of free time as well, and it can be difficult for learners to manage that initially. So providing that kind of support. So in the position paper, um, this is just a, a very condensed version. You can see I've just snipped a, a couple, a couple uh, rows here, but we provide a, a fairly extensive uh, self-assessment, basically looking at uh, emerging to em empowering levels of this in terms of understanding needs and wants. And at the organizational level, we can do this sort of self-assessment by looking at fundamental statements and seeing how how they relate to what we do uh, or at, at what an organization does at a slightly higher level. For example, an organization that's just emerging uh, in this regard, they may say, well, we need to investigate relevant policies and regulations. We need to develop our aspirations. Okay, great. This is a great first step. They've acknowledged it. Just like the learner who I mentioned previously, who acknowledged that they're not able to, to self-regulate yet very successfully on their own. So they invited their friend to study with them uh, to, to have this sort of co-regulation of learning. Um, they're, they're, they're both sort of acknowledging and also taking some kind of action, which sort of transitions into this engaging stage, which is we actively monitor policies and regulations. We consider these in our planning. We have a vision for self-regulated learning that is communicated to staff. Now, this isn't just a top-down perspective where the staff is being told you need to do self-regulated learning because we've all experienced situations like that and it's not very good. It usually doesn't work out. But this idea of communicating with staff, bringing staff in and making it uh, sort of a joint effort. And then finally, the empowering stage. All staff are aware of policies and regulations. Uh, all staff collaborate to implement them. All staff are involved in the development of a vision and collaborate to implement this. Now, just like the ideal self-regulated learning uh, learner that I mentioned before that I was a bit skeptical of, uh, this sort of empowering stage at the organizational level should very much be seen as an ideal. This is what we, we should be striving for. But I would say that from a very pragmatic or realistic kind of point of view, um, difficult to achieve. However, uh, we do provide some ideas uh, and some and that framework uh, within the position paper to uh, to, to try to, to get as close to this as possible. The next aspect to consider is, is understanding strengths and weaknesses as, as an organization. Um, so in this, in this regard, uh, you, there are various ways that you can build on uh, existing ideas. Again, we're not talking about coming in and throwing away the curriculum and starting from scratch, but it's about uh, learning from and building on prior experiences, current practices, uh, staff within the organization that are uh, knowledgeable and have, uh, you know, motivated to to be involved in these kind of processes. Useful materials such as the, you know, position paper that I mentioned earlier. There's the um, Oxford's, uh, you know, when you find the words campaign, which I was involved in developing some materials for. Those materials uh, help support self-regulated learning. Uh, you know, so finding those materials to work with, uh, identifying sources of time and funding, which is admittedly the most difficult, um, uh, but these, these pots of funding and uh, do exist uh, in certain contexts and sources of time, meaning uh, creating time within a weekly uh, schedule uh, for this to, to be able to take place, basically. Even if it's just carving out 10 to 15 minutes a week to just look at a particular strategy and, uh, and encouraging students to, to try it out and to monitor it and to reflect on, on you know, how successful it was for them. And again, Hayo will be talking uh, more about that in his presentation later. Um, so for understanding strengths and weaknesses, uh, we provide a similar uh, sort of self-assessment here. Again, as I said, these are just sort of snippets. Um, there are guiding and reflective questions that go along with these that organizations and teachers uh, can use to see how they're interacting with these different levels from the macro organizational to the more meso teacher level. Um, I'm not going to read each of these because I can see I'm already uh, getting close to, to time here. So um, I think we can just you know, uh, present this here for you uh, and, and you can see more in the position paper. I do want to leave a few minutes for Q&A and I've got a few more slides to get through. Um, so just to move to the last sort of key idea, which is uh, another key section 
of the position paper. And that's about setting goals and measuring progress. Now, as teachers, um, we have our own goals for our classrooms. Uh, I'm sure we, we whether these goals are ones that we have sort of intrinsically uh, generated on our own or whether they're passed down from uh, a policy document or curriculum that we've been asked to teach. Um, but we have these goals. It's important for organizations to have these, these type of goals as well. And I'm sure lots of people here will have seen this, this acronym SMART, the idea that goals should be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. And that we, we sort of encourage this idea a lot in the position paper because it's very easy for something like self-regulated learning or any kind of new or you know, trendy or innovative topic to be introduced um, in, a, in a formal education setting and then get forgotten about. Um, if there aren't uh, smart goals in place to where it can be monitored and measured over time. Time is very important here, setting sort of short-term goals in order to achieve some long-term goal of, of becoming slightly more successful in our implementation of these kinds of uh, innovations. So it's the idea that we try our best to make sure that the actions, programs, and projects align with the organizational vision and that teachers don't just feel on their own in trying to uh, put these ideas into practice. So again, a little bit of finger shaking here, looking at those in higher up positions, um, uh, which has been very absent in a lot of the discussion of self-regulated learning, but looking at how organizations can actually support this and not just uh, telling teachers, okay, you need to do this in your classroom along with everything else we've already, we already require you to do. Um, so crucial in order to, to uh, make this possible is that again, progress needs to be monitored. Um, as I said on the previous slide, it's very easy for something to be introduced, not monitored and then forgotten about, or it just kind of dissipates. I think we can all think of examples that, you know, in schools that we've worked in where something's been introduced and then it's never really followed up on and then it never really goes anywhere. So crucial here is for organizations to, to monitor this progress, again, not in a very top-down way, but in interaction with and in dialogue with uh, teachers. So this has a lot to do with uh, communication. Um, and then of course, being able to adapt the plan as necessary. So self-regulated learning is complex, it's dynamic, it's adaptive. It's something that involves lots of factors at lots of different levels. This hasn't been addressed very well in the existing literature where something like uh, social or context or environment has just been mentioned, uh, but it hasn't been made explicit about the relationship between learners, teachers, and these, these, other, uh, these other factors. So this is something we draw your attention to in, in the paper, looking at the interaction at these different levels of scale in terms of supporting this type of learning. So again, we have another table. Um, because of time, I'm, I'm going to just leave it here for a second and then, and then move on to conclude um, to, to plug Hayo's uh, presentation. He'll be talking about closing the loop, which is essentially moving from this discussion of this very uh, admittedly abstract kind of vague discussion uh, of, of organizations. And then he'll be sort of closing that loop, looking at what teachers can actually do in their classrooms. And again, if this time is, is inconvenient for you, you can catch the recording of that, uh, which will be available in about 10 days. Um, so to conclude, my final slide here, um, final content slide, basically just to reiterate some key points. Um, this has been basically a pitch for this uh, first half of the position paper, just highlighting some key ideas, uh, which are developed more in the paper itself. The main one is that successful self-regulated learning is an ideal, it's something that can positively impact long-term educational outcomes, but that it needs to be supported. Um, again, there's that paradox there of something that is self-regulation, self-regulated also requiring support, but we're looking at it as a developmental process with the ideal being the autonomous independent learner at the end of that process. Uh, it involves a complex set of skills uh, that do not come naturally. It's just like learning how to write. Writing is not something that if we just observe, we can, we can do automatically. It's a skill that doesn't come naturally to us. Well, successful self-regulation doesn't usually come naturally. It usually requires an interaction with someone who is more knowledgeable or more skillful. And this is where teachers come in because they can mitigate the challenge by taking this sort of systematic approach to developing students' um, self-regulated learning capacity and providing structured support, which, uh, which we 
expand on in the paper and which Hayo will be talking about later. Finally, organizations themselves, which is basically who I'm speaking to, uh, can support teachers by deliberately embedding self-regulated learning into their curriculum, assessment, and school managerial policies. It doesn't mean an entire revamp. It doesn't mean that we need to throw away the existing uh, practices, but that we can learn from them and to carve out some space uh, to develop these skills and to support learners and teachers in doing so. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, again, my name is Nathan Thomas uh, from the UCL Center for Applied Linguistics and uh, part-time at the University of Oxford. Um, if you have any questions about this presentation, I'm happy to, to take them now. I realize we only have about five minutes or so. Um, so if, you, if you're unable to, to ask your question or if I'm unable to answer it, uh, feel free to email me. Um, if you're interested in seeing my more academic work, which I've, I, I've sort of written quite a few papers about learning strategies, self-regulation and, and other concepts, uh, you can check out my research gate page where I upload papers for free. You don't need to pay anything or to be a member of an institution. You can download the author versions of all my publications there. And that's where the QR code takes you as well. So thank you very much. And uh, Sean, I'll... Uh, You've got five minutes. Yeah. So, there are, so click on the Q&A uh, tab. There are a lot of questions. So... Um, oh, no. Okay. <laughs> well, that's what happens if you deliver an interesting talk. People <laughs> people will ask you questions. Uh, so um, you'll probably need to scroll down a little bit to find a question that you want to answer. And then we'll uh, take you from there. Okay, great. Yeah. Oh, wow. This, yeah, this is a bit overwhelming. Um, we have, we, we bear in mind, they are all recorded. So you'll be able to get them afterwards if you want to come back to some, but, but. Uh, so. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to skip. Um, well, I, I, some of these I can address very quickly, just starting uh, at the top, this, see what's being upvoted. But it says, where does Nathan teach? Well, currently I teach uh, at, at UCL, which is University College London um, here in the UK. And I teach on a master's in TESOL, uh, program for pre-service teachers, and I also teach part-time on an in-service teacher program uh, at the University of Oxford. Um, there's, a, there's another question here about the differences between ESL and EFL. I'm going to skip that one and try to focus on on questions that have to do with self-regulated learning. Um, okay. How, how do you convince top management about the benefits of, of self-regulated learning was a question that came up. Um, I think convincing uh, management uh, can be can be tricky. Um, the organization, or, sorry, the presentation that I just gave, as I said, was um, uh, shaking my finger a bit uh, at, at top management, um, wh whatever that means exactly. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of research now looking at the benefits of uh, incorporating self-regulated learning interventions into different uh, language programs. Uh, this is something that. Uh, we have various meta-analyses and systematic reviews on now, which is essentially a collection of empirical studies that have been synthesized to come to some uh, sort of general conclusion. And the general conclusion is that in programs that support self-regulated learning, offer strategy interventions and explicit strategy instruction, students tend to do better. Um, now, again, I've, I've been critical of some of this research in the past, but I think that the main takeaway uh, I would agree with is that when uh, self-regulated learning and strategic learning in general is supported by teachers and by uh, you know higher ups within the same organization, that students do tend to do better and that these systematic reviews and meta-analyses can tell us uh, or provide us with, with uh, fairly concrete data that it's, that it's worthwhile. So I think going to the research is, of course, um, one way to do it. And if you're someone in a setting who doesn't have access to this kind of research, um, the, then, then feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to share some stuff with you. Um, I think I have time for about one more. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, so it says, when talking about uh, self-regulated learners, how about self-regulated teachers? Oh, that's a great one. Um, how can teachers become more autonomous educators and depend less on the institution or the system? Um, how important is it for a teacher to become self-regulated educator? Yeah, I think this is a great question. Um, so when talking about organizations uh, earlier, I mentioned um, that in order to make this uh, process possible or successful, um, we, we need sort of organizations to engage in their own self-regulatory process where they're uh, identifying policies and uh, possible uh, funding sources and carving out time in the curriculum. 
Well, I think in that same regard, uh, teachers can do that to a certain extent. Once they understand the constraints that they're working within, within a certain educational system, uh, having to having to um, meet certain aims that are already in place, while also trying to carve out something within that system in order to in order to implement it. Um, this is actually a great transition to the next talk, uh, Fernando. So thanks for asking this question, because the next talk that's coming up uh, is going to be about self-directed professional development. So uh, that's uh, actually a perfect transition to now pass it over and say that our next speaker will be talking about self-directed professional development. And hopefully you can uh, view that presentation with these ideas about self-regulated learning swirling around in your mind. And you can see how that may be applied to uh, a self-directed professional development type scenario. So uh, th thanks for uh, helping us to transition uh, right on time. And I apologize if I didn't get to any questions. F feel free to email me. I'm, I'm happy to, to respond that way. <laughs>